this information here, these are all the nutrients. This is what you're used to seeing on your regular soil report, okay? This information down here is what's new, and we're going to start to go into that. So this part of the, of the report, this is our water extracted carbon nitrogen, and then this part here. Any of you have done a Haney soil health test in the past? No? If you have, the Haney test is based on these numbers, so we can include these numbers for you if you want them, and these calculations are based on the NRC uh, S soil health test. The reason we put those there is if you want to compare it to some of the work you've been doing earlier on, now you, you have numbers that you can compare. We've added to it, though, is looking at some of this stuff over here. This is six inch depth. This is looking at the top six inches, yeah. So looking at um, our CEC, our K-to-Mag ratios, our percent base saturation, our fertility index, what we've put on there is giving you the optimum level. So we know for K-to-Mag ratio, that 0.25 to 0.35 is that sweet spot for potassium to magnesium ratio. And then the other, one of those other high predictors is percent base saturation of potassium, three to five range. So we give you the range and then where you're sitting. Okay, and then we start looking at uh, saturation of phosphorus. That was another key indicator. Uh, pH was another key indicator. And we give you those numbers. But then starting to look at this part of the report. So what we provide you with is this Solvita CO2 respiration. So I talked about that a little bit earlier. That's where you take a sample of soil, you dry it down, you re-wet it and measure off the CO2 given off. So it tells you, do I have a lot of microbes respiring the soil or do I not have a lot of microbes? So that's very important to know. Are there a lot of guys in the soil to begin with, okay? This reactive carbon is so critical because what the reactive carbon is, it's looking at the organic matter or the carbon in the soil that is uh, decomposed. So it's the plants are feeding on it it's potentially decomposing, and the living carbon that will become available to feed those organisms. The reason why this, is, this reactive carbon is important is because if you change something in your operation, so if, for example, introducing a, a cover crop or a green manure, this reactive carbon will be a very quick indicator because it can change fairly quickly. Did the management decision I made, was it good or negative, or was it bad? If you see reactive carbon go up, well, that was a good thing. If it goes down, what you did was going the wrong way, okay? Then we tie it all in with this soil health index. So if you have a poor soil health index, what you can do then is you can quickly go to these indicators and find out which one is an outlier and fix it. And it's gonna move your soil health index up, okay? So knowing the soil health index and what drives the, the, the key drivers, now you've got a management tool that you can start to look at how do I change it and move in the right direction. This uh, bottom piece, this residual soil chemist, uh, chemistry index, this is an add-on. It's not on the st standard soil health report. But what it does is we know there's certain groups of chemistries that actually uh, can create an environment that's detrimental to the organisms in the soil. But here's the good news part of that. If you have a high soil health index, those organisms in the soil aren't really affected by this residual chemistry. So you could have a fairly high residual chemistry index, but a high soil health index, it's really not an issue. They can withstand it. If you have a low soil health index, that's where it becomes a problem. And then you start to see those is issues with residual chemistry. So um, we also include um, the Sovita actual test where you have your organic matter and looking at the, the biological activity and the, and the CO2 given off. This is an example of a, a soil that has a lower soil health index. We start to look at the K-to-Mag ratio. We're just way out of whack here. And we look at our potassium. That needs to get fixed. Uh, and we look at a percent base saturation of magnesium uh, with some of these other indicators and then you see you've got this low reactive carbon. We have low respiration in the soil. 
which gives us also this so low Sauerhoff index. Does it matter about animal mimicry? It doesn't. These organisms go through a freeze-thaw process every single season. So it really doesn't matter if you're collecting a frozen sample or, or a dry sample. It doesn't really matter. Okay? Good question, though. So what does this soil health test suite look like? Well, um, there's that basic soil health test, which is this stuff minus the soil uh, chemistry index. Then we can add on, and we're doing a lot more work on some of these add-ons, where we can start to look at uh, the beneficial nematodes in the soil. We can look at heavy metals. We can do a vast test with looking at the aggregate stability. There's a whole lot of things that we can look at because we know when we talk about soil health, what we've discussed here this morning for the past hour is looking at the chemistry and the biology of the soil. But we also know there's physical properties too. That you can measure compaction. We can measure, you can do that right in the field, right? We can measure water holding capacity. We can measure the aggregate stability and start to really look at what are the other things that are affecting the microbial activity. So in summary, balanced fertility really gives us that consistency in yield and has a direct correlation back to the ecology of what's happening in the soil because that is providing this food source for these beneficial organisms.